up until now, we've been talking a lot about the macro level of architecture and urbanism. The zoning laws that make up these cities, the different characteristics that set them apart, how these systems work together, et cetera, et cetera. However, we can't understand how these large-scale cities actually work with one another until we understand the materials that they're made of, how they're put together, brick by brick. So let's break it down. What's this, a brick? Brick by brick! You've got bricks, what, what bricks? Oh, the bricks. The bricks? The brick building, red brick building. Now who would buy a brick? Look, I know what you're thinking. Rachel, you have gone off the deep end. Why should we care, let alone watch a video about brick? And let me tell you, I felt the same way about this stuff when I was studying it back in college. And then one day, I was enlightened by how this heavy, clunky, bare bones paperweight is one of the most badass building materials of all time. Bricks have been taking part in the rise and fall of towns and villages, cities and empires for centuries. Dating back to around 7,400 BC, used to construct infamous cities like Jericho and those lesser known like, I'm just gonna put that word on the screen. I'm so sorry, but this town in Turkey. It was a fairly easily accessible material because the ingredients that you needed to make them were always pretty local. Traditionally, it was being made only out of sun-dried mud, and later they added ingredients like grass and straw to act as a binding agent for when the bricks dried out. It basically made them stronger. They were also a lot more portable because it was an object that could fit in your hand versus a stone or a piece of lumber that was obviously a little bit more heavy or needed to be transported further distances. But at this time, there was still really only one big caveat. The brick was always a better suited material for hot and arid climates. Because as you can imagine, bricks that were only being used out of sun-dried mud were not as weather resistant over time, until about around 3000 BC when they were using kilns to make fire brick, which made it a much sturdier building material. I mean, the mud brick walked so that the fire brick could run. He understands me. By firing the sand, mud, and grass mixture, the brick underwent a process of cementation, making it much stronger and more weather resistant than it was in the past, which meant the brick could go to infinity and beyond, literally. This thing spread like wildfire. Go anywhere, you'll see it. Bricks. Okay, but hold on, I'm, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. They didn't get there just yet. They did start to pop up all around the world, and that's predominantly thanks to the Roman Empire, who, conquering from town to town, were bringing this technology to these new places. And as the brick began to rise in popularity as one of the best building materials in town, so did the competition for making the strongest brick bond combos. Okay, less of a competition and more of people just getting really created with how these things were being put together. The idea here is if you stick the bricks in a certain way, you have a more fortified wall. Varying forms of brick bonds were developed that range between stronger and less aesthetic to more aesthetic and less structural. Builders would use stronger brick bonds at the base of buildings, and if their clients were willing to pay that money, they'd be able to use more ornate bonds in the top that acted as decoration for wealthy homes or high-status public buildings. One popular example of brick wall bonding is the layering of two long side bricks to a short side. The long brick is called a stretcher, whereas the short brick is called a header. And when we see the header going into the wall, that means that there's normally another set of bricks behind it, creating a double layered brick wall. And those are typically structural. Anyways, this rudimentary rectangle began to really soar in different cultures and leave a footprint in different parts of the world because of the invention of things like the fire kiln brick and it being spread throughout the Roman Empire. Like what? I mean, this little lump of dirt mixed with a bit of human creativity begins to define the different characteristics that make up different empires around the world. I mean, call me weird man, but I, I love bricks. What can I say? And in 1855, with the advent of brick making machines, people could do this faster than ever, which means new construction was fueled by the brick new wave. And I would say that I'm not that crazy because modern day design would go so far as to make a faux brick type material, like not even structurally sound, to act as wrapping paper for buildings because we have such an affinity for the way that this stuff looks. 
Another great work aficionado is Alvaralto, who went so far as to dedicate his Moralto experimental house in Finland to the brick. At first glance, the facade of this home might seem pretty unsightly. There's a lack of uniformity, and there seems to be no direction or theme. Yet all the materials used to construct it are the same. Some patterns have thinner mortar joints between them, while others larger. Our eye is even quick to notice the difference in color of some of these bricks. These minor distinction in this otherwise mundane building material are the reason you know that this home is in Britain, while this building is likely to be seen in a country with a Moorish influence. Our brains make these conclusions based on the brick's color, size, and spacing, all of which forms distinctive patterns that threads the DNA of our past, present, and future cities together. Here you can see that the mortar style, for example, is much thicker than that of modern day brick construction. And the bricks are also a lot more thin, giving a nod to the traditional Roman brick that was normally thinner and in shape. This colored brick is probably the one that you're most used to seeing. And that's because they've pigmented these bricks red, predominantly in London, to help people see the buildings better in the city. And I think that's why I like them so much. In a way, they kind of remind us of us in our history. Their expansion into our cultures, the variety each one has depending on the available materials in a given place, it's adapted to our environments and our context just like we have. And thus, as we as humans have grown and developed as a species and in these different places, so has the brick. It's a symbol of strength and resilience and adaptability and even uniqueness. I mean, how could you not freaking love it?